Okay. Oops. That's not what I wanted. Actually, present is what I want. Okay. So, um, what I wanted to do first is to, to look again at Garcia's poems. They're short, so if we take another uh, look at them, uh, I'm going to, we'll start, which which would you like to start with, on staying or on leaving? On leaving. On leaving, okay. I can run five times around the village, my dog beside me. I have tested myself against her speed, my younger cousin's endurance, I win. My cousins go with me this morning. Their dark hair glossy, so young their shoulders. Their mothers tell me, watch over them. I've said goodbye to all who remain, grade village elders, wooden statues of saints in our school church, my mother. I go with the blessings of my mother and her sisters. I am the youngest of the girl cousins, no great beauty, no wealth to keep me here. I wear my sturdiest clothes, I carry a blouse one aunt gave me, a friend's old sandals for days when the heat persists into the night. My cousins who have made the journey send this advice. Travel early in the morning and at night. When you reach the trains, gain a space. In the middle, don't move. Oh, I'm sorry, there was no space there. When you reach the trains, gain a space in the middle, don't move. Don't let anyone steal your space. When we reach Mexico, we are to look for coyotes wearing yellow bandanas, not red or green. Those wearing yellow come from our region. They speak our language. They are known to our village. If no one waits at the border waiting, wearing yellow, we wait to take our chances. I have waited two years for this chance, no more. If the coyotes separate me from my two cousins, mis primas, instruct me, let them, let them take what they will but not my life, never my life. They think I don't know what they mean. I know what a man can take from a woman. I know my younger cousin's pride. I will protect them from their pride, our family honor. I will scream or fight if I can. I will run if I can. I know how fast I can run. That's a good one. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about that one first or do you want to read the second one? Does it, do you find they're better read together or separately? Together, because then we can make the connections. Okay, so we'll do the on staying behind them too. <clears throat> she thinks I don't know why she runs, not to catch the trains or escape the meet the outrun packs of dogs. I listened to the advice our cousins sent, the older girl cousins, Mary, hardworking girls who left our village with their husbands. The journey is harsh two weeks to a month. If she, I think that's supposed to be if she's lucky. So many dangers, only two male co cousins to protect her. My daughter has no husband. She cannot stay with me. I will have not have her stay with me to starve. She leaves with no wealth. She and her cousins are their own wealth. I see the strength in their arms and shoulders, blood that pumps through heart and lungs, no water, no beans, no corn. Today, the woman studying our village, una profe de los Estados Unidos, spilled our pot of beans. This woman has never known hunger. I saw hers hop when I sifted beans from the dirt, placed beans dirt and the bit of water I had planned to use for grinding the last dried corn. What is a little dirt, I thought, the same dirt in which I grew these beans. A child should not see a mother starve to death. A mother should not hear that her daughter has disappeared. I blessed this last child, daughter of my heart, the one I hoped would wrap my body in a serape and lay me next to her father at the edge of the churchyard. I bless her journey wishing her safe passage, safe passage, fleet journey. I have said my prayers to the village saints. I have eaten my small meal. Tonight, I will lay along myself alongside her dog. Perhaps tomorrow more food will come my way. Again, I will stay behind. I will wait and hope. Okay. Ah, hello, Datia, can you hear me? Yes. 
Good. Okay. You are joined here by Sadie, right? <laughs> Sadie's here. Say hi to Sadie. Hi, Sadie. Hi. Did you hear her? Yes. Okay. So volumes are all good. Um, and did, if you checked your inbox message, you have the presentation. So you can go ahead and open that. Okay. Okay. So we just reread the, the two poems. And um, what we want to talk about first, well, let's talk about what your reactions to the poems were. When you read these, um, and I don't know how many times you've read them. I love reading them every time. Um, how does Garcia create the meaning? I mean, what, what strikes you about the poems? Um, probably like the small detail and like, it's like how she says that she wears her sturdy's clothes and that, like just little things that like make the journey seem like as hard as it would be. Mm -hmm. And then how in the, on staying behind, the, how she says, um, how it says, like, the journey is hard to do to know that she's left me. Mm -hmm. Just like, there's a lot of little things that make the journey seem like very harsh. And right. It gives people an idea of like what they all go through. Very good. Dottie, what did you think about the poems? Um, I thought that the poems were well written and expressed. Were there any lines or images that really stood out to you? Um, um No, I don't, not necessarily, but like when the mom's talking about her daughter, mm -hmm. um, that's the how I guess. Okay, the way she refers to her? Yeah. What, is there a line there that that really kind of shows what you mean by that? Um. I don't know. Find find where she talk. Find a line that talks about her daughter. Um, the the whole thing. <laughs> um, not all lines do. Well, yeah, the are the. Then it talks about she and her cousins are there in stream. Very good. She and her, uh, let's see, where is it? That's the wrong one. It's, it's which on, which on dance? Right. Which one? The second one? No, you're on the right one. I'm on the right poem, but which uh, stanza are oh, you looking at? One, two, three, four, five. She and her cousins are their own wealth. I see the strength in their arms and shoulders, blood, blood that pumps through heart and lungs. That is a really good description of just, um, you know, how strong she sees her daughter. I mean, it's got to be hard to let her go, especially knowing that the journey is so hard. But um, definitely that's a, that's a good way for her to show that the girl is ready. As, as much as she doesn't want to let her go, the girl is ready to go. Okay. So um, part of what we want to uh, talk about is how Garcia creates this meaning, because that's going to become important later on when you're ready to start creating your own meaning. So as we read between the poems, um, uh, like Sadie, you mentioned earlier those little tiny details, and you had said that it's those little tiny details that brings reality to this journey that she's making. Um, what are some other things that Garcia does in the word choices or the way she um, structures meaning um, in even between the two poems? What is another, another thing that she does? She like incorporates a little bit of Spanish words, mm -hmm. and she also like 
when in on leaving like they she talks about like how she runs with her dog and then the first uh stanza says um and like how she was running and then the first stanza says on on staying behind it says she thinks they don't know why she runs Mm -hmm. and then at the end it says i will lay myself beside alongside her dog and like it also talks about in both poems they talk about advice from cousins Mm -hmm. so it kind of like showing all the family connections Mm -hmm. too yeah um Datia, what did you think of the line where she says, I lay myself alongside her dog? Did that did that strike anything with you? I thought maybe you thought died. It does sound like it, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I got that same feeling too when you, you know, although we know dogs sleep a lot. But still, the way she worded it, yeah. I got that impression too that this is a almost a death here, and mm-hmm. um, and the fact that the mother requires that companionship of the dog. And when you look back at on leaving, oops, wrong. Where's my actual on leaving? Here it is. Um, the dog is beside her here in you know and and what is the dog's purpose really right the dog's more of a you know a pacer um and and she's well i don't know i it may be me because i love dogs my dogs are a lot to me but they're my children but she seems there's there's no other reference made later on she says goodbye to the elders she said goodbye to the wooden statues of the saints which we'll talk about in a little bit Mm -hmm. but um it does sound to me like okay i can leave the dog whereas for me i it would just tear me apart but the mother is the one now who who takes care of that but it does sound like she's um it almost like a death you know um Any other things that strike you about the two poems that uh, um, what, how does Garcia create the meaning? Because remember what these, uh, the two poems together are talking really about what? What's the theme that goes across these two? Kind of like they're less fortunate in like having to separate from your family, Mm -hmm. make the journey. Right. How like hard it is. Yes. And the reasons behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what can you infer about the reasons behind why the daughter feels she needs to leave? Dakia, what do you say? I don't understand. Well, um, after reading the two poems, do you do you know what the reasons are why the daughter has decided to leave? Um. I think she decided to leave to have a better opportunity, mm-hmm. a better life. Yes. Better by by how? Um, <laughs> not sure. Can you um, help say Yeah, for like both reasons because they were like about to start mm-hmm. and she didn't want to start. Right. And there's it's it's that life of poverty that is um there's no opportunities there. You know, when every day is a struggle to survive, how can you grow, how can you achieve? Um so how does Garcia get across the oh what well, well let me let me ask you this do you think she's trying to make a statement about something in particular um, maybe like how bad like their of a place they're in like wealth wise mm-hmm. because she mentions like when the person like spilled the beans. She says like 
that with like a little dirt anyways. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. yeah. Usually, like, they'll eat anything because mm -hmm. they don't have a lot. Right. Good. Dottie, what message do you think Garcia is trying to um, give her audience? What do you think she wants us to realize? I think she wants us to realize how hard life is in other places and why they leave their places to come to America. Yeah. And she says a pretty good job. Speaking of jobs. <laughs> okay. So one of the tasks that you're asked to do is to find an additional reading selection that demonstrates the extent to which the issues Garcia addresses in her poems are timely and important today. The idea is for you to connect the literary texts to our current social moment themselves. Did you both have a chance to do that yet? Um, I'm on. Yeah. You're on that one right now, Dakia. Can, uh, can you bring up your article real quick? Which what what did you find? I found an article on a bunch of people from Honduras or Guatemala or something, and they were all coming to cross the border. And the reason why was because they wanted more opportunities and a better life for themselves. Okay, where did you find that article? The news. Which news? <laughs> Who's the source of your information? I will go and click on it and see. Yeah. One second. Okay. And we are joined by Abigail as well. I'm going to let her kind of get caught up here. <laughs> And I shared with you the, well, we're not, oh, you're just going to turn that in today, right? Oh, we're not discussing that today. We're on okay. the third module today. Okay. Yeah. Um, the on leaving and on staying behind. Did you get to read those poems? No. Okay. Well, we, I have shared with you this presentation in the inbox message. So if you wanted to grab a computer, or if you just want to watch this, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, downstairs over on that side of the office there's a cart okay. by the sink thank you uh-huh <clears throat> okay um sadie for oh did you find the source yet datia yes what is it okay it's so good. oh it says npr npr national public radio very good uh, probably was a transcript from it about a, a program. Um, are you familiar with NPR? No. Okay. Um, the uh, PBS, the public broadcasting system, they're the ones who, well, they would, they play it. Um, it's it's kind of like in the same category there. And so it's a nonprofit organization that presents a certain viewpoint on the news and, um, all kinds of viewpoints, actually. And so this is probably a feature story that they had. Uh, now, Dakia, I was surprised you didn't mention something that I know you did with us as a sophomore. Do you remember your sophomore year? Yep, that'd be the one, Enrique's Journey. Um, did, did that ever kind of pop up as you were reading these poems? Did you think, hey, I think I may have read something about this? Yes. Yeah. So, were, have you read Enrique's Journey, Sadie? No. Okay. Abigail, have you? No. no. Um, great book. Great book. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing. Enrique is a, a young boy. His mother wants a better life for her children. So she uh, decides to go to the United States to get her family some money because she remembers seeing television programs as she was cleaning people's houses who had a television and she would watch uh kind of glance over and in the united states of course everybody has maid everybody has food everybody has 
what they need. And so she thought, I will go to the United States and find some money. And when she got there, she didn't realize how hard it would be. In the meantime, this five-year-old boy she leaves behind is very distraught that his mother has left. And so he, he um, rebels. He's supposed to be staying with his grandmother, but he runs away. He stays with his dad. He stays with an uncle. Uh, then he gets into sniffing glue because he's depressed. And then finally, at the age of 15, he says, I'm going to go find my mother. And so the journey actually takes him 18 months. And he almost dies. They almost beat him to death in Mexico. And so it's it's that same kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so it's out there. It's definitely out there. Now, what you're introduced to within this module is what's known as stasis theory. And I've embedded this, um, and I want to see if this is going to play through the, sometimes when I have Google Hangouts on, it doesn't play. But let's see if we're going to have uh, volume here on this. Stasis theory nope, we're not going to have volume. So you have this uh, presentation that you can look at later. Um, I think this is a very uh, simplistic way that this professor describes what's going on. Basically, stasis is at rest. And so whenever you want to, um, when, when there's an argument to be had, what you want to do is find out everything you can about the situation in an objective way. So what is the, you're examining it from all different angles. What is the situation now? And uh -oh. so. Where are they stand on? Okay. The first thing you do is you need to do, to figure out what the facts are. What are the facts that we know? And so. Um, you're just trying to define what the problem is when it comes to facts. You will also want to make sure you come to agreement on the definitions of whatever the controversy is all about. In this case, it, it, it does happen to be immigration, migration, immigration. We'll talk about these in a minute. So you start with facts. Here's what we know. Here's how we're going to define what the problem really is we need to know what the components are to define them and then a question of quality it how how severe is the issue how problematic is this that needs the solution and then finally the question of policy what is it that needs to change and how do we know that change will be effective so when you're looking at stas status uh, that sorry stasis that's what you're doing and so what we want to do is take a look now at this transmigration so moving from one country to another or why you would do it so uh, questions of fact would include what causes transnational migration what are the effects of current US immigration policies what is the history of immigration in the United States one of the things you're going to be asked to do is create another question of fact. Looking at these three questions, what other question do we need to answer before we can now start to try and find a solution to a problem? Like with this, with mm -hmm. translation migration, mm -hmm. we have to find out what that means. Okay, and that would be in the that would probably be in the definition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, actually, that's probably a good. My question of definition would be: What exactly is transmigration? You could use that as your question. But what other facts will would we need to know, especially with the issue the way it is now? What what fact is important to understand? to be able to successfully argue about it. What are they leaving? What are they leaving? Yeah, what's causing them to want to come over? Right. What is the real cause of their wanting to leave their home country to come to the United States? That's a very good question of fact. OK. Any other questions of fact? Dati, anything else we should know about this before we start talking about it? Mm -hmm. 
I'm you you're I'm needing to pull your wisdom teeth out I think um I'm kidding okay do, do what do we know what facts do we know right now about this and and transmigration just so that we can get that far what does the prefix trans mean or the root go between very good and so migration obviously means to move it's move right so it's moving across and in this case it's moving for across countries borders so what causes transnational migration and this is coming back to what are the reasons why somebody would want to leave their house what what do you know as fact right they're leaving some sort of danger especially in these south american countries it's usually uh related to kingpins drug kingpins and very violent and because of the way they've got control of everything that's why there's a lot of poverty they're not they're keeping the money to themselves there, there's no any kind of economy that works in these countries right which means you're either you know <laughs> usually involved in drugs and then everybody else mm -hmm. um what else do you know what are uh, now as far as the current of the effects on current u.s immigration policies this is a hard one because this is where you really need to start getting some facts are there facts that you know about this um. It's a long time. takes a long time right uh do you know approximately how long it takes to go through the legal process of becoming yeah see and see why it's important to know the facts because i've heard it's a long time too um Plus, I've heard the fact, and that's actually probably a bad way to say it. I've heard the fact that um, I've heard personal accounts, and it's the personal accounts I have heard that how difficult it is. First of all, you have to find transportation to Fresno. Yeah. Then you have to find, I mean, it does require some money. Um, does it require a lawyer? Do, do you need... Um, a lawyer's help in order to get through the process. I believe so. Do you some cases? Maybe, uh... I don't know. Again, we need to know the facts, right? Yeah. So that's why it's important to know the facts before you start arguing. Mm -hmm. Because what is the argument um, when, when, if you were to ask anybody on the street, hey, what are the effects of the current immigration process? What's the knee jerk reaction you're going to hear? That a lot of people aren't being let in, and that it takes a long time for them to get citizenship. Okay. And you would talk to probably a different group of people, too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more people, vocal people out there, who are saying, What, what have you heard, Abigail? If, if someone, or if you're just hearing on the street people talking about, you know, those people coming in from Mexico, what are the effects on this, this policy? Well, based on where we are, we're a very conservative part of California. Mm -hmm. People aren't necessarily as welcoming or wanting of people coming over. Right. Whether it's legal or illegal, you know, there's a lot more pressure than still in the immigration. Right. And the reason is because they don't know the facts. Right. And that's why stasis theory is so important is that you have to know facts. And, and a lot of people don't want to hear those facts um and you know they may they but we need to know what those arguments are how long does it take are all of the people who come in specifically coming in illegally what would be the legal process they still come in it's the same thing with costco you can't you know you're supposed to have a card to get into costco but what if you don't have a card you still have to get into costco to get the card yeah. it's the same kind of thing so um, we need to know the facts behind that before we can actually 
discuss what the actual effects are. And then what is the history of immigration in the United States? Hopefully we know a little bit more about that because of history class. <laughs> what do, what are facts about immigration to the United States? Um, yeah, and that a lot of people, like from many different countries in the mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, people from Mexico. Right. But the fact is that we did take the land from natives and people who were a part of the United States. So right. They, especially Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas was um, not supposed to be our land, it was supposed to be Mexico's land that we were just living on. Mm -hmm. We went to war for it. Right. And obviously, we acquired it. Yep. And we've had a history of wiping out the native population that has been living here to make room for our population. Not even intentionally. Mm -hmm. In some cases it was, but right. mostly it was just diseases and right. um, things that they were using to make room Notice, as the facts start coming out, how, how much stronger arguments become. Um, so when you are discussing with somebody what the issue is, you, and you ask them, what facts do you know? And then it's difficult for them to kind of come up with them. That you, and so facts are important. You need to study what the facts are about any topic before you start getting into a discussion about it. Okay, definitions. So um, what are the differences between emigration, migration, and immigration? Immigration is, it's, uh, E always indicates as in exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. Where's the exoskeleton? On the, outside. On the outside. So E always is associated with the outside. So emigration means outside. Mm -hmm. Coming in, or no way, going to the outside. I'm sorry, moving outward, moving uh, outward. From the US to yes. Okay. Yeah. And in this case, it's people are emigrating from Mexico oh. into the United States. As they come into the United States, then they become immigrants, immigrants right? And migration is simply Maybe. any movement. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how are transnational, we already defined transnational as between two countries, how are transnational migrations related to other socio-political events or experiences? What do they mean by socio-political? Well, Abigail mentioned one earlier. What is the number one reason they're leaving from Honduras and uh, Guatemala, the South American countries? Oh, because they live. Yeah. The drug pin, the kingpins, right? Because they're su it's such a dangerous, um, and so there's no real government control in those countries, and so that is what caught. I mean, honestly, do you think these people really want to leave where they were born, where they grew up, what's familiar to them? But because that the socio-political climate has become so dangerous, they have to in order to survive. That's what that means. Are there any other things that possibly could affect um, these experiences? Right. So. And again, it's hard to disconnect that poverty from the political environment that it's in. Mm -hmm. So obviously, yeah, I mean, some people can get along with very little, but you know, at, at some point they have to have something to eat and if there's nothing to eat, they've got to go find something. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you might want to, you might think of that might, let's think now in this country, what socio-political events or experiences in this country is going to have any kind of impact on a discussion about this. <laughs> the current president. The current president. <clears throat> okay, and I'm gonna try real hard not to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is that contributing to this discussion? 
stick with the facts and the definitions. <laughs> it could have a negative connotation to this discussion because of his influence over what people think because of his position of power and what he's saying. Okay. And I feel like there's a lot of opinions instead of facts mm -hmm. going around that people and people would want to listen to the opinions that kind of comfort them mm -hmm. and make them feel like what they believe in is right. Mm -hmm. So then the facts kind of get misconstrued mm -hmm. and then now and we find people using Wikipedia to find like facts and stuff real quick to like kind of argue their way when like, when you do like click an uh, actual like news right. that's valid for the information. <clears throat> I had seen a political cartoon that I think spoke a lot about this because you're right, the slogan, I like how you said it was the slogan, build the wall. This political cartoon shows a wall is built and then it shows an airplane flying over the wall. Mm -hmm. And I forget exactly how it was indicated, but it was like, you know, <clears throat> There, I think there was a symbol, a drug symbol that was on the airplane, but the, you could tell that the, the airplane had the drug kingpins on the airplane flying over the wall. And so the, the, the question now becomes, you know, the, this wall, what specifically is this wall supposed to do? Um, and how is it guarded and how is it, because this probably is somewhat inappropriate, but I just found it amusingly funny. But uh, the joke was, what, what really do the Mexicans think of the wall? Well, they'll get over it. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it's, it comes to that, uh, what is the wall supposed to do? And I think that is part of the definition. You know, build the wall, define that phrase, define that slogan, build the wall. Mm -hmm. And to me, that means figuring out exactly how it would, it's supposed to work. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, you're also thinking, yeah, but there are people who enter the country legally. Are you keeping them all out or, you know, anyway, again, this comes to in the stasis theory, figuring out what's real and true at that moment. Yes. People's emotions and feelings do come into it, but you're getting all those facts lined up first. Okay. Um, what are key features of immigration? I, and when, I think what that means there is uh, not just what's happening, but the effects of the actual event. Okay. Well, there would be like the key feature would be like the population rising. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the population is rising in America. And the resources that we have become more spread. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I think that's how we're defining what the core issue is. There's another one. So it's not just the resources, but what else, especially on the, the people who say that this is not a good idea, taking jobs. What is the number, especially now, what is the number one concern of people who are supporting this wall? Why do they want to keep the migrants out? Because they think they're criminals? Yes. They're associated with crimes. Uh, again, that goes back to having to research the facts and finding out exactly how many are we talking about here. And are these people who have just come into the country? Are these people who've been here for a while? Are these people who, uh, because of how they are living in this country, that causes them to commit crimes? So that's, that's again, part of the definitions that we're looking at. What are push factors and what are pull factors? Do you know what that question's asking? Um, maybe like why you would push for like stricter immigration laws and mm -hmm. why you would them? Right. So it is that the, the 
tug of war here between the two sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think we have talked about those. What were the, what are the push issues that we need to deal with this problem? The ones we just talked about. Jobs, resources, criminal activity. But what are the pull factors? Have more um, people who are going to work mm -hmm. instead of like office jobs, like stuff like that. Like they're going to work like, in the fields. Mm -hmm. And I, not too long ago, I saw on the news that there was like a, sh like a shortage of field workers. Mm -hmm. So they, that's what they could do, and they could help the agriculture. Yep. And at this point, um, <clears throat> people who get paid more money are bilingual. Mm -hmm. They need people who can speak the languages. And we're not just talking Spanish. We've got people speaking all kinds of languages, particularly here in California. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so... It's, we need people because there are people who are here legitimately, legally, who don't speak English as well, who need medical attention, who need uh, all these services. So it is, yes, that's the pull factor. And, and uh, particularly with um, DACA and, and the issues behind that, I hear a lot of personal anecdotes about um, you know, young people who've been here since they were children, who have gone through our education system, who've graduated from college and how now have uh, productive jobs in our society and who are giving into that society through taxation, through services, and yet they're being sent back. And so those are the push-pull factors that you would look at specifically. Gatia, was there anything you wanted to add to any of this? Mm -hmm. No, I knew she was going to say that. <laughs> okay. You do realize next year when you get into college, you're going to need to open that mouth and start talking, right? Yes. Okay. So start practicing. <laughs> I love you, you know. Okay. <laughs> Question of quality. So um, this is kind of taking the temperature of as to... Uh, is how serious is this problem based on the facts, based on the definitions? What what really is the issue about this? So, um, oh, one question I forgot to ask. Were there, no, I did ask it because you had asked what was the de definition of transmigration, but are there any other definitions that we might, should be defined before any discussion takes place? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on, but it's something that you can think about later. It's, um, and, and you can always come up with, you know, if you're having a discussion with somebody and there's a, um, uh, an idea, some kind of abstract idea that is set, you would want to come back and say, can you define what you mean by, because if you're, if the, conversation is hinging on the definition of that word, then you better make sure you both agree on the definition of the word. So, okay. Uh, quality. Again, taking the temperature of what uh, the seriousness of the problem. So are current U.S. immigration policies harmful or helpful? I think they can be pretty harmful because there's a reason that they're trying to immigrate and that would be because they're pretty angry. It takes so long to immigrate over what's the point they, they could be dead or injured before they even get a chance mm -hmm. yeah i think it's more harmful too because uh, with like the policy and stuff even with the like travel ban that we had or like just like border security and stuff like we've seen people like like what just happened in i forgot where it was new zealand yeah like there I saw a video of someone with a 
Make America Great Again hat, and it was in New Zealand. Like, and then also a while ago, like at the border when they all got attacked and there was tear gas and like they were attacking each other basically. Mm -hmm. And like we see more of that instead of more helpful things like how to help them like get background checks and like get in, inside the United States legally or like giving them like actual asylum or like not separating them from their families. Mm -hmm. Like instead of helping with that, we see more people getting hurt from Mexico and from the United States. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's more helpful. Have there been, are you aware of any instances in which these policies have been helpful? There are people who have come across legally and they now have jobs and families. Okay. But those stories are either often overshadowed by the harmful stuff or they're just few and far between. Okay. See where definition and fact come in is being important because that's really how you back these up. You show those instances. And I I have talked with people who, do you know how hard it was for my family to come to this country? And actually I have my own story. I am the first person in my family born in the United States. Can you guess which nationality my parents are? <laughs> More white people like you. <laughs> Canada. My family came from Canada. My mm -hmm. grandfather uh, immigrated with his family because he was getting into business with an American, and so they were going to move to Michigan to start a restaurant. And so they went through the process, and then it turned out that the guy he went into business with took his money and ran. And because of the immigration policies at that time, if my grandfather did not get another job within six months and start earning money, then they all would have been deported. Yeah. So he actually had to leave the family to go do these odd jobs around, and he also got some training. Uh, so it was touch and go there for a few months when they came into this country, but finally he was able to uh, get a job, get trained. He is the one who started Oasis Air Conditioning. So where it says established in 1968, that was my grandfather. He mm -hmm. sold it in 82, but um, yeah, I'm very proud every time I see one of those trucks. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, it, you know, it was tough. It was really tough. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that you research that you get into to find out. Um, and again, backing them with facts. So are there any other questions of quality? Oh, I skipped one. Uh, is it harder to be the family member who leaves or the family member who stays behind? I would think it's hard for both because, like, of the poems we read and also, like, my grandma's experience mm -hmm. and, like, her family's experience. And, like, we've talked about it and, like, sometimes on the news, it she'll like see what is being said and like what's being done and she gets really upset about it because she like remembers how hard it was for her family and when they got she was born in texas but her mom was the one who came here and like they were working in the fields like every day from like the sunrise or like whenever they were told they could come inside and like they lived off of like tortillas and sugar mm -hmm. and like stuff like that for dessert and stuff so like, and then she would like talk about how like her mom and her dad had to leave like their mm -hmm. family to come to Mexico, and so I don't know. I feel like it's hard for both people, like both families, like the family. Yeah, especially because the people who stay behind on the west coast being attacked by people who they were trying to flee from, mm -hmm. or the main breadwinner left so they could get a job. And now they have no in stable income to support getting food, getting clothes, right. getting to school. Mm -hmm. so oftentimes these mothers leave their kids and oftentimes these are single moms right. that are coming over trying to make a better life. And these kids are left by themselves or working on way out or mm -hmm. just another family member, but they can't provide as well because they're elderly. Right. So they run the risk of being being hurt, uh, being killed, 
poverty, mm -hmm. and then you have the guilt of the person who left coming over here, mm -hmm. and then them also dealing with people who are negative towards immigrants, right? And the whole political climate that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I like is the way you guys pull information. Now, you're, it's personal anecdote. So what your grandmother went through and the discussions that she had, plus reading the poems and the other readings you have done. So you're pulling in, okay, this is the information I'm going with. Would you think what would be the most powerful of the evidence? The facts and statistics, personal anecdotes, or a combination of them? A combination. Why? Because... I feel like if you're trying to like make your point valid to someone who sees differently than you, if you like say something personal and then like also related to how a lot of other people, like how their lives are and how like they can also relate to your personal story, mm -hmm. then it kind of makes it more real and serious to the other people person mm -hmm. and they'll like kind of take it more seriously instead of just like dismissing what you're saying because of their opinion that they think is right okay what do you think abigail how is how is it best to a fate to to have a discussion like this with somebody who disagrees with you i think it's this conversation is any conversation that's a big is going to be hard um having both personal, personal stories and mm -hmm. Statistics is important, but there's always going to be statistics to back up either side because you can find you can find those numbers that you want. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to go out and look for oh how many illegal immigrants have killed people because that would totally invalidate your argument. People would go out and look for successful stories of illegal immigrants right. because that would completely invalidate their side. So it's a careful combination of both, but nothing's going to entirely win the conversation. A very valuable lesson in the area of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and and the so and that's really especially as you're going into college, that's what you're gonna realize is that the you're coming to an agreement on this. You still have strong beliefs, but by having a conversation that is based on these things that we're going over, that argument becomes less emotional and, and more into, we really need to solve problems here and figure out exactly what the problems are. So that way you're not in this shouting match with which unfortunately the adults today are not doing a good job modeling for you. <laughs> they, they truly are not. And so hopefully you're our next generation of, yeah. of, of right, critically thinking, uh, sound-minded adults who know how to, how to argue. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question of policy. So this is where we actually look at, does this situation need to change? And if so, how? And what's the most effective way to do it? So some of the questions for the policy would be, should the United States change its immigration policies? Why or why not? How should nations respond to the global refugee crisis? Should parents have a say in the lives of their adult children? Is there any other question of policy that you could add to this? Uh, maybe. Um, something about the... Um, security on the border okay is there a, do we need to beef up security on the border how or and if so how yes definitely especially with the wall what what how is the wall going to do this that's what i want to know that's my question how's the wall going to do this but uh okay, so um and notice that especially with these questions people like to go straight for policy because you put this on here on Facebook or Twitter or social media at all, you're going to get all kinds of responses to this. Mm -hmm. But are any of them going to be based on the facts, the details, the definitions? So that's why this one's kind of last. 
because it helps you kind of get everything, all your little ducks in order before you actually now start to look at it. So now that we've had, we have those on the table, should we change your immigration policies? Why? We have both sides, Democratic and Republic, saying this is horrible. One side saying it's restricted, one side is saying that it should be less restricted. Mm -hmm. And if we have both sides in discontent, where are we going? We need a middle ground. Okay. And if not a middle ground, then we just need to find a way to help these people get in and have a safe life. Mm -hmm. And they need to do it in a timely manner, in a way that they will be cared for and not in danger. Mm -hmm. I think that instead of making it like build a wall and like more security, it should be like maybe more security, but to make it easier and safer, and then like helping them get to where they need to be to find what they need to get to be a legal citizen mm -hmm. instead of like holding them at the border so they could get killed or like hurt and instead of just watching that happen just like help them get through and um and i also feel like instead of everyone being so negative because I feel like a lot of the political parties like they kind of want to just argue and like which I'm right now you're you're wrong kind of situation so instead of like having so much tension like like she said like kind of find a middle ground mm -hmm. instead of no it needs to be this way or this way. I think one of the problems with our major political they just want to glorify themselves and they don't realize that these policies that they're fighting for affect actual real life people who are getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Separated from their parents. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad enough. Yeah. Datia, you have to you have to weigh in. Sorry. Hello. Hello. What do you think? Should the United States change its immigration policies? Why or why not? Oh my God. Um, we should. Um, um, they should change it to. I don't know who said it, what else they said it, but to not so harsh at least, mm -hmm. an easier way for them to come in, but still with enough to make sure that it's safe. Right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> you did it. Congratulations. <laughs> um. And the next one here, to me, this is where the next, it's the next question I think it really is where this problem comes from. How should nations respond to the global refugee crisis? I honestly do not think that people want to leave their homelands, but they have to. And why do they have to? That's the part that we need to address. And so um, if it's the, the drug runners, and it's all the, the, the drug uh, economy that's driving this. And we're not helpful because uh, we're their biggest customer when it comes to drugs. And so uh, we need to, and it's not going to be an easy fix. We've got to find a way to um, bring down these these kingpins and, and to... Uh, the drugs themselves are harmful to our country. The, the, the poverty in this country, and a lot of it has to do with drug use, and it's a cycle, because the drug use 
deals with that that depression that comes with the poverty and it's just circular and and so it's and there are not enough resources in this country to help everybody who wants them reading enrique's journey and that journey happened 15 20 years ago she didn't have the money she needed she did the best she could she was able to send some money home the kids had clothes the kids had food the kids had education but they were depressed because they didn't have a mother and so this is this is what we need to respond to and we certainly don't need to respond and 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 i i think it we do need a more streamlined way i have uh my husband teaches a sunday school class of um there are six cambodian adults came over they are boat people um so they're in their 70s now and now all of a sudden sui the the well actually book there's two of them sui and her sister are trying to become citizens they want to become citizens because they're scared to death that they're going to be sent back to cambodia and they've lived here for 20 30 years yeah. so that needs to become easier Okay, are there any questions of, we did, I did ask that, right? Are there any other questions of policy you could think of? Okay. Um, sorry, just get, this one gets to me. <laughs> okay, and we've, we've already kind of done this. We've, um, based on the questions generated, your readings and your observations, what are the most important considerations to figure into this discussion? So this, this is kind of like, okay, I'm all wound up now. I need to figure out what is the direction I need to follow so I can keep myself grounded. What, how, would you, how would you now encapsulate all of what you have into one statement of either judgment or policy when it comes to immigration? This is where you basically make a claim. Immigration policies are helpful and should be less and should be more helpful to both sides. Okay, good. Abigail? Just because you're scared of a lack of jobs and a lack of income for yourself doesn't mean that you should put somebody else in the worst position that they can to something worse than poverty. Very good. I like that. Okay, Dacia. Uh, it's on this. It's on, I'm on this. Um, I forget what number this is. Says the, now you enter the conversation. What is it? Slide 10. Slide 10. Based on the questions generated, your readings and your observations, what are the most important considerations to figure into this discussion? What claim can you make right now? Um, let me ask you this, Datya. Is this an issue that concerns you at all? I that, that's a bad way of wording it. Let me ask you this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, do you know anyone who is affected by what's going on right now with immigration? No. No. Um, is there a certain viewpoint that you have heard that you're thinking, you know what, I think we need to do a little bit more research into that? Not really. Do you watch the news at all? No. Okay, that's probably where we've got. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard any of this arguing? I'm not here in this discussion, but is this anything that you have heard or have been exposed to outside? A little bit, but not really. But not enough to actually, you know what? That's no. that. Then that's 
probably where <laughs> we'll be at because you do need to have that information. So if you don't have a lot of that information, um, it's hard to, to talk about this subject. Let me ask you this then, from reading the two poems, mm -hmm. what is the impression you have about the issue just based on the two poems that you read? Uh, Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know how to word these things. I know, sweetie. That's why we. That's why I torture you. <laughs> you need to practice in it. Dottia, just 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 between you and me, what do you think of the poems? Oh, okay. Um, I thought that they were good poems. They had a lot of they had meaning behind them, and they were heartfelt. Okay. And what did they mean to you? You said they had meaning. So what did they mean to you? you it meant to me that in other places we're not as fortunate as we are and some people i guess not necessarily want it but need it a better life and so they seek it and this is the story of them searching for a girl searching for it i now know what the issue is you're not confident with your responses. That's what it is. Yeah. What you just said was perfect. And it was just because you're answering a question I asked you just out of, you know, what is it? That's your opinion. You now have the understanding of what, why, re, what the reasons are that people come here and that, you know, how unfortunate they are. That's the perfect one. You need more confidence in yourself. And in your, yeah, that was it. Okay, so here's the writing test. I love this one. Um, because I, I'll tell you right now, after 1984, the hard stuff's done. Okay. Um, and so in this one, we're having you find your voice. You are about ready to embark on your adult life. So now it's time to start talking like one. For this module, the culminating activity is asking you to express your feelings in a creative way, just as Diana Garcia expressed her feelings about a particular issue. Read the prompt below, which is actually on the next page, and consider which of the choices would best fit your personality and creative side. Consider the topics raised by Garcia in her poems. In what ways are any of the issues in your own life or community, which are issues called the, which of those issues calls urgently for a response now? Now, I want to, uh, there were several people who asked me about this question. No, you do not have to talk about immigration, especially like in the case with Gatia. She's not that familiar with it. So it's best that she not pick that topic. She, uh, you need a topic that you will have the details, the facts, the quality, the, the policy. And so um, the three options are this. She's wanting one form of writing to express your ideas. And this comes from all three. You too could create a set of paired poems that explore the topic from different perspectives. And there is no limit on, um, no definition other than that, they are both poems. So if you can do it in two short poems, that's great. But keep in mind what Diana Garcia does, the, the very things that we talked about, the little things, adding the Spanish, adding, you know, the, the small little details that really bring out a lot of meaning. That's kind of what you want to also include. Or, poetry isn't your bag, you can create a nonfiction incident, uh, it, uh, creative nonfiction means like an autobiographical incident or reflective essay. 
It can also be a prose poem. Uh, prose poems are basically those that are, you have the poetic devices like figurative language and imagery and all of that, but it's done like an essay. Um, or you could do a profile feature article and somebody did say, what exactly is that? That would be, um, if you were to write a feature for a magazine, it's an expository, basically, an expository essay that talks about, uh, it could be a single person's story. That could work. Or it could be, what are the facts now? You could take all of those questions, those stasis questions, and create an essay that just says, okay, before we start arguing about this, let's put the facts on the table. That could be a profile feature article, okay? So choosing one of those three, the narrative creative expository, um, what issues would you want to discuss? You have kind of an idea right now on the issues that really concern you. Did you want to share them or no. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> And you have some great resources. So you could do it from a personal perspective. You could do it from a, a global perspective. So yeah, you can continue with the immigration issues. Abigail, what about you? I was in immigration too. Okay. I'm, I'm not in traffic, so. Okay. You see a lot of the, yeah. That's why I was like getting here. <laughs> Oh, okay. No, you were fine. Um, good. Dacia. So I know this is going to be rough. What issue, what issue concerns you right now? What is something that drives you? That's your passion that you're just like, you're fired up about. Uh. Um, nothing. nothing? Um, there is nothing that drives you right now. There is nothing like, like, oh, I don't know, something in athletics or something in, uh, I don't know. College bribes. <laughs> College bribes. There we go. What do you think? <laughs> See, it's hard when you don't watch the news. You don't know what's out there. You don't know. You, you need to get involved in your world. What's wrong in your world, Datia? Um, um, absolutely everything. Okay. What can yeah. you? What? What do you have the most control over in that? Everything. <laughs> Well, the thing I mostly know about currently that's happening is abortion. Okay. Yay. That will work. Uh, yes. Get that one. Abortion. And, and it, you know, what is it? Whether or not you're still going to fill out all those questions. You need to come up with those questions about the, uh, okay, let's go back and find them. Okay, policy, quality, definition, fact. Okay, the, and, and because abortion is so emotionally charged, to me, I think it's as emotionally char it charged as this because it's still talking about lives, mm -hmm. the very existence of people. And so you want to go through and find these questions so that you can make a statement about what you feel about abortion. Sound good, Dakia? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So you would you would uh, figure out the stasis of the issue, and so you might. It, it depends. What do you actually know? So you go through. What facts do you know? Definitions and quality. You can do the research on this, and the best part about this is the only option you would need a work cited for is if you did the third one the feature article the feature article would need a work cited to go with it but if you're doing poems if you're doing the um narrative you don't need necessarily to cite it you just need to get those facts in and make sure they're right um 
so I don't know why I have two of these slides in here. <laughs> Which one is the best way for you to speak in this conversation? And this can change. So um, if you start, you know, I'm not into poetry, but so you start writing and then all of a sudden you start coming up with these really poetic ideas, then maybe you can shift. So um, you guys, you, you probably want time to think about this unless you know what you want to do. You guys know what you want to do yet? Poems. Poems? Yeah, I think I was going to, I'm not really, I don't really do poems, but I think it would be cool if I like kind of asked my grandma yes. stuff and like I could probably do something with that in yeah. your home. Yep. Like the experience of living your mom. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and even if they didn't come out in poems, that would be a wonderful feature article. You know. I think I want to change it on the I think I got foster care. Foster care. That's that would be great too. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh we have information here too. So yeah. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, so here's what the timeline is. The first draft is due Sunday night, 1159. Now, um, when I actually got to see Diana Garcia last summer, she was, she uh, read these poems aloud to us and she said, I'm still revising these. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know if I have the actual final draft. So there's always another draft. So, but this is going to kind of give us an opportunity to see what everybody's thoughts are and give somebody else a chance to respond to it. So if they get, get that turned in by Sunday at 11.59 p.m., then the peer reviews will be assigned at 5 a.m. the next morning. The seniors are the only ones who get that five hour extra time period, by the way. So if you, get, if you turn in your poems at 1.29, they will be assigned a peer review and you'll be fine. So peer reviews are due on March 26 at 11.59. Now let's look at what I did put in the peer review process, the, the slides, because I know this is kind of, it's kind of wonky the way you have to go back to the first draft to find it. So just follow the instructions that are here uh, in the presentation. Um, then you're going to do what's called a purpose analysis. This is what you will actually look at. Uh, when you're looking at somebody else's paper, or if you don't get it turned in on time, this is what you'll do for your own paper. Um, you're trying to see if you're going to say what the what you think the message is behind whatever project you get. And so it's not going to be, this is definitely going to be an implicit claim or statement because it's going to be done differently. It's not an essay. So you're going to say, here's what the message I'm getting from you as I read your pa paper. And so um, then as you read it, what do you think the writer wants the audience to know? What do you think the emotions are that the, on that the author wants the audience to feel? And then the actions, what do you think the author wants you to do after reading this piece? And then um, you, in the past, present, or future, you want to explain what the writer wants the audience to make a judgment about the past, understand a statement about the present, or decide a course of action of the future. It could be all three. Just, just what do you know the author, what are you thinking the author wants you to do with this information? Is it something that you have to look in the past about? something you want, you need to address now or look at now or something that needs to change. And then just a little quick, right? How would you describe the purpose of this text? What do you think the writer hopes to accomplish through his or her argument? And does the argument serve multiple purposes? If so, what are the most important? And then what I love about this is that you are going to tell the writer what you gain from reading this piece. And that way the author can look at it and say, well, I had, that's not what I intended at all. <laughs> and then they can go back and revise. But I think more so it gives that affirmation. I got the message, message received and understood. So I, that's, that's what I really like about this. So remember what you do is, is once you fill this out, you hit the share button, get the shareable link 
and then that gets pasted into the comment section of your author's assignment, and then you just submit that for the peer review assignment. Okay, and then uh, we complete it, and then that. So that's what I just said. So, are there any questions before we leave for the day? Datya, what do you? What questions do you have? I don't have any. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. All right, sweetie. Um, you know where I am, in case you do. So, all right then. Well, I am so looking forward to these. This, this, this is the part I've been excited about. So, anyway, um, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you later. <laughs> Bye, Datya. Bye.